Hello BookTube, and welcome back to Book Trek 2021. This is a five-month mission I am embarked on with a bunch of other booktubers where we are reading Star Trek fiction. We're picking from the vast ocean of Star Trek fiction the thousands of novels and short stories that have come out over the last 30 years. And we're going franchise by franchise. So August is Star Trek the original series, my own favorite Star Trek. Uh, I've been there from the beginning. I was watching Star Trek and being blown away by all the things it was doing that I did not expect when it was originally airing. And I wanted more. Like, every, like so many other fans, I wanted more of what I was seeing. And there was no more. It was canceled after three seasons. Uh, it was moved to a disastrous new time slot and then canceled when it failed to, to perform. And even before that happened, fiction was blooming everywhere because there's so much raw material in those three seasons of the original Star Trek. There's so much stuff to draw on that even if you didn't invent new things, even if you just wrote about those old adventures, you'd never run out of material. Which is why uh, I would say the Star Trek fiction that has appeared since James Blish novelized the, the uh, original series, since Alan Dean Foster novelized the animated series stories, uh, since the original anthologies, Star Trek The New Voyages and Star Trek The New Voyages 2, I would say that th that, that is why the fiction that's shown since then, that's been published mainstream, uh, I would say has split right down the middle between uh, stories that break new ground and stories that revive some old idea or concept or personality from the original show. It's always a, a crapshoot as to w which of those approaches will be good. I myself tend to prefer whole cloth to somebody going back for to give us yet another adventure of Harry Mudd uh, or something like that. I keep track. I read all Star Trek, so I uh, I keep track of the fiction universe adventures, further adventures, further developments of the characters who are in that first. Uh, incarnation of Star Trek, those first three seasons. Uh, but I tend not to enjoy those books as much, uh, with a few exceptions. <laughs> with, a, with a few notable exceptions, I tend not to enjoy those books as much. But for this uh, Book Trek read-along, this, this reading event, I'm intentionally going back to Star Trek novels. I'm not, when it comes to Star Trek, the original series, I'm not going to anything. I'm going back to things. I've read all these things. I've read them hungrily, eagerly, for so long when we had when fans had nothing i was willing to gobble up any kind of garbage that came out and then even when fans did have something when star trek the motion picture came to theaters when star trek uh, 2 the wrath of khan came to theaters uh, and suddenly there was a tv show and then another tv show and then another tv show and comic books and whatnot even then when when fans didn't have to you know settle for just anything, when they didn't have to scrabble for any kind of fictional representation of these characters that they love, the habit had already been ingrained. So I kept reading these things. But in the 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 guideline that I'm using for myself for Book Trek 2021, at least for Star Trek the original series, uh, is to go to books that I read quickly, that I've only read once, that I, I didn't pay much attention to, that I certainly don't remember loving, to see if maybe I can find grains of worth in them and that has happened that has happened a few times August still has quite a bit of length left in it so I'm just going to keep going and today I picked a, a Star Trek novel that I I didn't like the first time it came out and that that was that just rolled over from the negative impression of the cover every once in a while Star Trek novels uh, the original series have a very good track record I think of fairly presentable covers uh, but once they started drifting away from the standard look of a painting, of a, 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 a painting done over a studio photograph of William Shatner or Leonard Nimoy or something like that, once they started doing just straight up photographs and weird little computer generated collages on the covers, uh, they lacked a lot for me. And that's the case here. This is a, a novel by Pamela Sargent and George Zabrowski, who are two talented science fiction writers. And this is Garth of Izar. And I think you'll see from from this cover what I'm talking about. It's just hideous. Uh, and this is an example of the second kind of Star Trek that I was talking about. Those of you who know the show 
the original series, will remember the episode Whom Gods Destroy, in which Kirk and Spock are trapped briefly on an insane asylum on a planet called Elba 2, uh, with, the, uh, with the galaxy's only, with the Federation's only handful of remaining untreatable psychotics. We are, the impression we are given in the era of, of the Federation and of Dr. McCoy is that most of what we consider to be mental instability or mental insanity is curable in the 23rd century. There's only a few, a handful, who can't be cured by the medicine as it's understood and they, they are sequestered on Elba 2, which is not an M-class planet. It, it's lethal to human life, uh, to humanoid life. It, and the, the insane asylum is in a heavily shielded dome. And efforts are being made to help the inmates. That's why the Enterprise is dispatched there. They are bringing a new serum that is supposed to help these people. And one of the people on Elba 2, one of the people at that insane asylum is Captain Garth. A, a, an honored Starfleet captain whose tactics and military strategy are required reading at the Academy. A hero to young Jim Kirk. Garth Visar is completely insane and we learn in very brief brushstrokes in that episode what, some of the nature of his backstory that he, would, he was injured uh, on a planet named Antos and that the natives, the Antosians, taught him the technique of cellular regeneration. So they saved his body and they taught him what in the episode is just shape-shifting. The ability to shape-shift not only his body but his clothing as well, his outward appearance as well. Uh, and the implication, the strong implication in the episode is that that ability drove him insane. Uh, and that there was a mutiny on board his ship and he was he was relegated to Elba too. One of, uh, not, he's not the only insane starship captain that Jim Kirk meets in that first three seasons. We get a couple of uh, there but for the grace of God examples of why we should prefer Captain Kirk. We get uh, Captain Garth of Izar. We get Captain Tracy, who goes insane without any traumatic injury of any kind. He just goes nuts. He's just, he has a deep-seated uh, megalomaniacal psychosis that apparently went undetected in years of, psycho of psychiatric battery tests that Starfleet runs on its captains. We know that from the original series that you can't be, you can't have a screw loose and be a Starship captain. But Ron Tracy is <laughs> very much, he is insane and it's it's a little damning uh, because you you know in the situation in that episode that that same circumstances would not have driven Kirk insane. Likewise Commodore Matt Decker, uh, the father of the Will Decker that we talked about uh, in an earlier episode of Book Trek 2021. Uh, Commodore Matt Decker also goes insane, briefly, and, and I don't want to use the word benignly, but less comprehensively than Tracy or Izar, or Garth of Izar, uh, in a great episode, in, in a great, great episode that has one of my favorite it has some of my favorite dialogue anywhere in Star Trek the original series that that uh, that episode is is the one where Kirk is on a derelict ship he's on the Commodore's derelict ship he's trying to get it into some sort of fighting shape and the Commodore takes command of the Enterprise using simple military seniority and when Kirk they're on they're in communication with each other via communicator Spock is constrained by the rules of the service he can't he can't just say no the Commodore assumes command of the vessel. But he's, they're in direct communication over, over uh, communicators with Captain Kirk. And Kirk says, you mean you're the lunatic who's, to, who's been risking my ship? And Commodore says, you're speaking to a senior officer. Kirk says, where's Spock? <laughs> Decker says, I'm in command now according to every regulation in the book. And Kirk says, blast regulations. Give me Mr. Spock. And Decker calls, him, calls Spock down to the well of the bridge. And... Uh, Kirk asks him for status. Spock tells him things are absolutely dire. We absolutely cannot fight this malevolent alien machine. And yet the Commodore is ordering us to do that. And Kirk says, I order you to take command of the Enterprise. On my personal authority as captain of the Enterprise, I order you to relieve Commodore Decker and take command of the Enterprise. I don't know what that means. I've never known what that means on my personal authority as captain of the Enterprise, but I like it. 
it's a great moment. <laughs> and Spock immediately, he immediately acts. He doesn't need anything more than that. We've already learned in the episode of The Ultimate Computer that a starship also runs on loyalty to one man and nothing can replace it or him. Spock immediately tells the Commodore that you're relieved. <laughs> the Commodore says, I don't recognize your authority to relieve me. And Spock says, I don't want to place you under arrest. And, he, and the Commodore says, you're bluffing. And he says, Falcons don't bluff. <laughs> uh, there are, there aren't any who are anywhere like any kind of great dialogue like that in, in Whom Gods Destroy. Whom Gods Destroy is just a bad Star Trek episode. And it infuriated the original cast. Uh, one thing in particular infuriated Leonard Nimoy. Not he was he didn't really do Fury, but it, it really irritated him. There's a scene, a very predictable scene in that episode, where uh, Captain Garth uses his shape-changing abilities to masquerade as Captain Kirk, so that Spock is faced with two Kirks and has to decide which one is which. Uh, and it, Leonard Nimoy and a couple of the the writers for the show said Spock should be able to figure this out using logic. It shouldn't be resolved the way it's resolved, and yet, <laughs> uh, in the course of the episode, our, the good guys win, and Garth Rizar is given that experimental serum, and as the episode ends, we see him completely different than he's been in the rest of the episode. He seems to be normal again, he, and he seems not to remember anything that happened. He asks he asked Jim Kirk, should I remember you? Should I know you? Uh, and that's kind of sort of where this novel takes off. And it's bad. It's really, really, really bad. I don't know what happened. I don't know why. Maybe it was a rush job. Maybe, maybe it's an ill-fitting collaboration. I know from personal experience that fiction collaborations are not easy. The chemistry has to be perfect or the product will suffer. But what, whatever the reason is that describes why this is such a lackluster novel, uh, in this novel, Kirk and crew on the Enterprise, this is the first, the first uh, five-year mission of the Enterprise, are informed by Starfleet that Captain Garth has made a formal petition to Starfleet to be reinstate, reinstated as a command-level officer. And they're agonizing over it at the beginning of the books. McCoy is saying, well, Kirk is saying, well, he's, he's cured, you've watched him, you've monitored him, all of the other people at Elba II, who took that experimental serum, have gone on to lead productive lives. They're, they haven't had any relapses. Why should we think anything different of Captain Garth? What, your own regulations, it's said over and over again, your own regulations uh, give you no choice but to listen and adhere to his petition. Even at, the, I'm no military person, but even at the beginning of this novel, before it went on, I was howling in outrage. <laughs> when this first came out and then for this reread, I was howling with outrage. I was saying, no, no, no. What kind of a turnip truck do you think I just fell off? This is a guy who turned on his own crew. This is a captain who went insane. This is a captain who was in an insane asylum and who has the ability to mimic any other human being, any, any be anyone around him. Starfleet would never let him anywhere near Starfleet headquarters, much less on the bridge of a ship. Never in a million years. If you're court-martialed, you're not going to command a ship again, much less one of the 12 starships of the Constitution class. I was howling at outrage. There's, there's willing suspension of disbelief, and then there's something like this. So I, I wasn't on board with this novel, I guess. Maybe that's a little unfair of me. Uh, maybe that means I, I didn't give it a chance the first time or the second time, but I, my hackles were raised just as much the second time as they were the first time. It would never happen. The premise of the novel would never happen. But it does. Starfleet says that Garth of Izar has a proposed mission and that he wants to be a diplomat to the Antosians, the people who remade him, the people who gave him the ability uh, to shapeshift. He wants to be an ambassador to them in order to heal relations between the Federation. Obviously, the, the, those relations are raw because the starship captain tried to annihilate them. One thing we learned from from whom God's destroy is that Garth of Izar tried to annihilate the Antosians. He didn't just take the, their healing and then go. He tried to wipe them out. He's the natural choice to extend the olive branch, to, to heal relationships with them. And Starfleet says, well, Kirk will be in control of the day-to-day -day operations of the Enterprise, but for the mission, Garth of Izar will be in control of the Enterprise. 
nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Just crazy. Just absolutely crazy. It, 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 I just it, the the type of of basic plot that I can't believe got by an editor to even become a novel. But it happens, and there are tensions. And the one thing I will I will credit these authors with, I'm thinking mainly Pam Sargent, uh, is that you do end up kind of delicately rooting for Garth of Izar, not for him to succeed in his mission, but for him not to relapse. The portrait of him is such that you, you're delicately hoping that the thing that certainly would happen won't happen. He wants to go on this diplomatic mission. He views it as a way for him to expiate his own private sins. And the novel progresses from there. And so you may find the, uh, the conclusion interesting you will not find it anything more than that there is never a page of this novel that's exciting but also damningly the prose is bad and that's not Pamela Sargent so I, I that either has to be uh the corporate suits that we've mentioned just extending their hand into the novel and saying no, I want to change this no I want to change that or uh some sort of defect of collaborating I don't know what the reason would be but this is a deadly doll novel and and although Although Garth of Izar seems to be in character, we don't know much about that character, so there's not much you can say, you know? The, in the course of the, of the canonical Star Trek, the original Star Trek, we don't get much in the way of really getting inside the head of, of other Starship commanders. We meet quite a few of them, past and present. We meet quite a few of them, but we don't get to know any of them at the extent that we get to know Jim Kirk. And we certainly don't know anything about Garth of Izar, the sane person. He gets one line in Whom God's Destroy. And after that, it's all conjecture. The character that's portrayed here, the character that's given to us, Garth of Izar, is so likable and so aware of how hard ev everybody else must find it to trust him that you kind of end up rooting for him. But the book is boring. And the premise is absurd. So, <laughs> so this is, the, unfortunately, Garth of Izar is not a book trek recommend. Uh, there is a great novel that could be written about Garth of Izar. I feel certain of that. I feel I've been tempted to do it myself. It would have to get around that whole bit about the Antosians yeah. because of course you can't teach a human being the technique. It's always called that. The technique of cellular regeneration, of metamorphosis, of shape-shifting. Humans aren't physically able to shape-shift. <laughs> so you can't teach them to do that any more than you could teach them to fly or punch through a stone wall. You would have to you would have to augment them somehow. You'd have to implant some sort of device that would allow them to do that. Or maybe I guess do something with their DNA. I have no idea what that something would be. Uh, even that wouldn't allow them it would have to be technological because when the when Garth of Izar trans transmutes himself, when he when he shapeshifts in whom gods destroy, like I said, he changes his physical appearance, yes, but he also changes his clothing. The whole thing just winks out, and it looks like a visual effect. It looks like something that's done with, I don't even know, implanted holographic technology in the skin, something like that. The novel that I would write, that would would be called Garth of Izar, would delve into that quite a bit. Uh, but this isn't that novel. It's not meant to be, first of all. It's not meant to be an origin story of Garth of Izar, but it's not a good follow-up either. To whom God's destroyed. It's just a it's just a boring little book uh, that starts out from an impossibility and goes through a couple of other impossibilities before it reaches its conclusion. So I can't recommend it. But I didn't want to let Book Trek 2021 go without a recommendation. And oh boy, do I have one on this subject. Uh, we are told over and over again in Whom God's Destroy that Garth of Izar is the hero of Axanar. That he was heavily decorated by Starfleet for his victory at Axanar. A-X-A-N-A-R. Uh, and there is a Star Trek fan film called Prelude to Axanar. I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. It's about 20 minutes long. And it, uh, any of you, it stars Garth of Izar and a couple of other characters. Be Garth of Izar before the Antosians, before his insanity, before anything like that. W him as the decorated starship captain or soon to be decorated starship captain. Uh, Prelude to Axanar is a great idea. It dramatizes, or at least starts to dramatize, an event that is very much present in Star Trek past, but is never alluded to directly, never addressed, 
certainly never shown, which is that at some point before Star Trek the original series, the Federation and the Klingons had to be at war with each other, open war with each other. Sometime before the start of the original series and uh, leading up to the enforced peace of uh, the Treaty of Organia. In between them, the Federation and the Klingon Empire are at war. And we see a lot of that in the, in the fan film, Prelude to Axanar. And I, if any of you have ever watched any Star Trek fan films on YouTube, well, you're probably cringing right now because it's, a, it's, a, it, it's causing flashbacks because they are unbelievably bad. They're unbelievably bad. They don't win the record. As far as unbelievably bad fan YouTube productions go, I'm not advising that you do this, of course, but the, the number one winner for that is fan productions of the DC comic book character Nightwing. <laughs> Trust me, don't go looking for fan film productions of Nightwing. There's one that's good uh, from Isma, Isla Hawk Productions. All the others are not just bad. I don't even know a word for them. They're, if bad is at the end of the spectrum, they're way over here in the outer darkness. And that is true. A lot of that is true for Star Trek as well. Oh my. I have seen so many fan productions of Star Trek stuff on YouTube. I've watched endless hours of it. Uh, Prelude to Axanar is not like that. <laughs> okay? I want to I stress that. It's got a couple of, of uh, really good actors from Star Trek from various franchises of Star Trek. It's got Richard Hatch from Battlestar Galactica and the new Battlestar Galactica. He plays characters in both. He plays the Klingon bad guy in Prelude to Axanar. And it's wonderful. Well worth the 20 minutes that you will watch it. Even the special effects must have cost a boatload to do. Uh, so there you go. You get a Garth and Axanar recommendation. It's just not this book. This book is a little on the boring side. Uh, but don't miss Prelude to Axanar, especially if you're a Star Trek fan and have somehow never seen it. Don't miss it. <laughs> so there you go. That's Book Trek 2021 for today. Uh, we'll see what tomorrow brings. <laughs> Thank you, Book 2.